So now we're, we are moving to our contributed speakers before lunch. We have three of them. The first up is uh, Boris Hannon from Texas A&M, and he's going to talk about neural tangent kernels uh, in networks with finite depth and width. Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to tell you about a project I've been really excited about. It's joint work with Mihai Nika, who's at University of Toronto. And the purpose of this project is to understand as carefully as possible the corrections that come from having finite width and from having simultaneously large depth to the neural tangent kernel. So, so let me very briefly remind you what the NTK is. We've seen it a couple of times. But I'll tell you a somewhat different point of view on it, I think. So the setup is the following. We have a neural network that I'll write script n. And I'm going to denote by theta sub p the trainable parameters of the network. And then the definition of the NTK in principle is very simple. It's a kernel that depends on two points, x and x prime, which are inputs to the network. And it's defined by summing over all the trainable parameters in the network, the derivative of the netbook, network with respect to the trainable parameter at x, times the same thing at x prime. OK, so it's a simple definition, but it might not be obvious why anyone cares to study this kind of thing. Well, the reason is that if one wants to understand the dynamics and function space that are induced by stochastic gradient descent, really the neural tangent kernel gives you a good sense of what's happening, at least in the small learning rate regime. So if lambda is the learning rate, then to leading order in lambda, one obtains the following dynamics. So rather than studying the usual dynamics for the trainable parameters, what I do is I fix an input to the network, and I ask, under one step of gradient descent, what's the update delta n of x to that particular value of the output of the network at that input? So the answer is the following. If this will work, there we go. So it's proportional to learning rate, and I only keep the first order term. So what you do is you take the empirical inner product over the batch, that's script b, and then you fix the first slot of the kernel x to be the point x at which you want to know the update. And then you let the other slot in the kernel vary over your data set, or in this case, over your mini batch. And you essentially take the dot product with the gradient of the loss. But now the gradient of the loss with respect to very simple parameters, this is just the values of the output of your network. So, so that's what the NTK does for you. Yep. S say that again, please. Yeah, so the, uh, right now I'm thinking of a scalar output, but you can tensorize this to many outputs. It's essentially the same. It just looks a little bit more complicated. Yeah, thanks. OK, so, so, so the goal of this project was, unlike a lot of work which studies the neural tangent kernel in a regime where you fix the depth of the network and you let the width become extremely large, I want to know the effect simultaneously of width and depth on the NTK. And, and kind of the take home message is that there is a new and non-trivial regime that comes out if you allow the depth to grow with the width. And you just cannot see this by first letting the width go to infinity. You lose information by doing that. OK, so, so, so let me give you a picture of how I think about the NTK. So, so here's parameter space, where in some sense we start doing SGD. But then rather than work in parameter space, we map to function space. So, so for me, function space is some big infinite dimensional space, like the space of all continuous functions. And somehow, all the functions you ever compute with your network live in this space. And in fact, all the functions computable by your network make some interesting manifold in this space, which I've drawn as this funny looking sausage shape. So, so if you give me a particular configuration of trainable parameters, I get the function you get with the trainable parameters set to those values. And then if I were doing an unconstrained optimization in function space, I would have just a raw gradient of the loss, which points me towards the set of functions that have zero training loss on my data. Generally speaking, that's an infinite dimensional affine space. And you know, if you think of the regression loss, for instance, it's just the convex function you're optimizing, and the gradient is very simple-minded. However, you can't just do unconstrained optimization. You have to stay on the manifold of functions you can compute using your network. And what the neural tangent kernel k theta does for you is essentially it's like a Ramanian metric on this manifold. And it tells you how to take the vector, which is nabla l, the raw gradient, and tells you the actual direction you're going to go along the manifold. So, so, so there's a nice geometric point of view. The NTK is essentially equivalent to a Ramanian metric on this manifold. And it encapsulates the dynamics of training. OK, so, so, so that's what the NTK is. And then what's the classic story about what we know? So, so there's some very nice kind of work that in some sense originated the study, the work of Jaco et al. So, so what they did, like I said, is they fix the depth of the network. They allow essentially any nonlinearity. And they send the width to infinity. And they ask, what does the NTK look like? The trouble is that a priori, you exchanged optimization 
in parameter space of a very complex function with respect to a very simple metric, just the flat metric, for optimization in function space of a very simple function but with respect to a very complicated metric given by the NTK, and it's not clear you won anything. But their point is that if you send the hidden layer widths to infinity, two things happen. So first of all, in probability, the neural tangent kernel k theta concentrates around its mean. So this is some limiting mean kernel k infinity. And the point of this kernel k infinity is that it's independent of the particular point at which you initialized. You get this convergence with probability, or if you work harder, you can probably get it with probability 1. Um, and moreover, this k theta is independent of anything about your data. It's just some a priori kernel that's determined by the architecture of your model. OK, so this statement is not a hard statement. This is like a law of large numbers. This is just that initialization. The number of trainable parameters goes to infinity. The sum defining the NTK has more and more terms. And it becomes self-averaging. That's not a crazy statement. But the more interesting statement, in a sense, is that when you actually do the dynamics corresponding to SGD, the kernel itself never changes. It's like you got a constant coefficient Riemannian metric on your space. And so as a result, instead of just studying SGD, if you took the particular limit that they take, which has a couple of problems which people have pointed out, and I'll, I'll say something about that in a moment, but it just reduces to doing usual kernel methods. You have some reproducing kernel Hilbert space. You're looking for a minimal norm solution, at least if you're doing a regression loss. OK, so, so, so the point is that neural network optimization, which in principle is very difficult and nonlinear, in a particular regime degenerates to kernel gradient descent for a fixed kernel. OK, so what I want to say is that uh, because k infinity is data independent, it's the kernel you get at initialization, there, in a very precise sense, you can do no feature learning in this model. The feature vector associated to the kernel is just frozen. And that sort of is at odds with a lot of the things that we think intuitively about neural networks. Somehow, we think exactly about learning interesting representations, and therefore learning data dependent features. And you know, in practice, when you compare the NTK regime to what actually wide but not infinitely wide neural networks do, the NTK doesn't do as well for, for a variety of reasons. And I would say we don't completely understand why. But one of the reasons is we believe that the real NTK actually learns data-dependent features, whereas the infinite width one doesn't. And that's, I would say, one of the criticisms for this model. Yes. It, it's data independent and doesn't change during training. OK, so, so, so this was the starting point for this project. We wanted to understand what is the effect of freezing the depth in this model. Because somehow, depth is supposed to be important. And depth, in various ways that we understand and don't fully understand, helps things like expressivity. It helps to temper the learning dynamics. It helps give all kinds of benefits. OK, so, so that's where this work came in. So let me tell you about the first result. Um, OK, so the setup is this. We took what we felt was the simplest non-trivial case. You take a depth D ReLU network, just fully connected. Uh, I call the input dimension N0, and I freeze the output dimension to be 1, although actually you don't need this for the results. It makes them a little bit easier to state. And then you can have any hidden layer widths you want. I call them N1 up to ND. And you should think of all of them as being fairly large but finite. I really want to do an analysis that gives you quantitative errors in terms of finite width and depth and tells you how the NTK behaves. Okay. So, so I'm going to do this at initialization first because, well, that's how the NTK story begins. You get some frozen kernel at initialization. That was point one in the Jacot et al. theorem. So my weights are initialized the usual way. They're symmetric around 0, and they're scaled to have 2 over fan in variance. And then I set the biases to 0 at initialization, but I keep them in the list of trainable parameters. OK, so, so I take this to be kind of a simple but you know, not too crazy model. And the theorem is then the following. So the theorem is that there are two constants, little c and big C, which are universal constants, which have the following property. So if you look at the normalized second moment of the NTK, so you take k theta and you look at it on the diagonal, the two inputs are equal, and I look at the expectation of the square divided by the square of the expectation. So this is the kind of thing that converges to 1 when you fix the depth to be something and you let the width go to infinity because you have no non-trivial fluctuations and it's asymptotically just a constant. However, what you see is that the depth has a really dramatic effect. So, and the effect is captured by a single parameter beta, which depends only on the architecture of your network. So namely, it's the sum of the reciprocals of the hidden layer widths. It's like an inverse temperature for this model. So 
if you think of all the hidden layer widths as essentially being the same, if they're all equal to n, then beta is like the aspect ratio of your network. It's d divided by n. And what you find is that the fluctuations at init of the neural tangent kernel are exponential in beta. And we even get the constant in the exponent. And then plus, we have an exact correction that tells you that these results are effective. You don't have to send the depth and width to infinity. So, so in a sense, the upshot is the following. Oops, upshot is this way. So the NTK in this regime is not frozen at initialization if you take deep and wide networks. So somehow the fact that you got a very degenerate thing at initialization was a, fact, it was a consequence of the fact that D was fixed and N was much bigger than D. So, so that's sort of the new regime coming up. At, yep. No, so they're universal constants that depend only on the measure you use to initialize the waves. Well, so, so, so indeed, if you work harder, you can make little c and big C both things that are one plus something that goes to zero if the width is much bigger than the depth. But, but we are interested in the fluctuations. You know, if beta is a positive number, then it doesn't matter. This gives you the order of magnitude. You get large fluctuations. So, so, so that's right. But, but this is the easiest version kind of to, to state. OK, so, 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 so that's, that's result number one, that in fact, at initialization, you sample from an ensemble of kernels in the NTK limit. And the ensemble really depends on some parameter that has to do with your architecture, as long as you have deep and wide networks. So f yeah, 5 is, strangely enough, it's 2 divided by 1 half minus 1. And the 1 half comes from the ReLU being on and off half the time. So if you did a deep linear network, you would get a 3. You'd get three over, or you'd get a two, sorry, you get three over one minus one. So, so okay, so it has a meaning in some sense of the word meaning, right? Okay, all right, fine. So, 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 so how, do I, how do I think about this? So, so I kind of imagine it like this, you know, here's a, my cartoon. I have the depth of the network and I have the width and I'm trying to figure out which architecture I want to choose. And we know if we freeze the depth and we let the width be very large, you know, if the depth is one, there are many descriptions of the infinite width limit. There's the NTK, there's the optimal transport, there are very interesting spline stories. And then for deeper depths that are fixed, I only really know the NTK story as an overall method to study the dynamics of training. But somehow, there's a regime in which you get a random NTK, where it's not frozen, and that's this regime that's parametrized nicely by beta. So you can be infinitely over-parametrized, but not have a deterministic NTK. That's sort of take-home message number one. OK, and then take home message number two has to do with the following statement. You might say, OK, sure, you randomly sampled your NTK at initialization, but does it just remain pinned to that initial value throughout training? Right? That's the other part of the Chicot et al. story, that the kernel never changes throughout training. And the answer is it doesn't, actually. OK, so that's, that's the second result. So to set up this result, what I need to do is I'm going to fix an input to my network, and a vector in Rn0. And I'm con going to consider delta k theta of xx. So you'll see that the techniques have to do with only allowing yourself a single input at a time to the network. So I study the neural tangent kernel on the diagonal. And I ask, what's the update due to one gradient descent update that comes from a batch of size 1 that contains only x? I can only deal with one input x. But already, this is something. This is something about the dynamics of the NTK. OK, so, so then the theorem goes like this. It's kind of deja vu all over again if you don't look too closely. So again, there are some constants, little c and big C. And again, you could make them 1 plus something that goes to 0 if you worked harder. And here, I have a different object. So I'm asking, what is the mean change to the NTK divided by the mean size of the NTK at initialization? And what you see is that, again, it's essentially exponential in the same parameter beta. But there's one prefactor of beta out in front that scales out. And this is consistent with the fact that if the depth is fixed and the width goes to infinity, beta goes to 0. And so you see that the mean update to the NTK is 0 in the infinite width limit. And we already know that. That's the statement that the NTK, or that's a very special case of the statement, that the NTK is frozen in the finite depth regime. However, you see that not only is the NTK random at init, but its first gradient is also random. And so you are going to have some non-trivial evolution for the NTK if you're in a, both a deep and a wide network. And it's quite an interesting question to figure out what, in fact, is the evolution. And OK, you know, ask me in six months, but it's harder to solve because the evolution is not trivial. And so, so, so I'm, I'm trying to think about the dynamics. But what I'm saying is that in this kind of regime where your network is both wide and deep, 
not only do you start with a random NTK, but your NTK can evolve past initialization. And that for me was kind of an important thing to establish because I wanted to see if there was a kernel regime in which the kernel can change and learn data dependent features or not. And the answer is yes, at least in this very simple model of ReLU networks, the kernel regime is obtained by taking deep and wide networks simultaneously. Okay, so, so let me just ask how much time there is. Three minutes. Okay, let me say one word about the proof. So, so okay, maybe this is my picture again. I just put here that they're non-trivial NTK evolution, also in this non-trivial beta regime. Okay, so, so what's the idea of the proof? Why do I need ReLU networks and all of this? So there's a nice combinatorial formula for the output of a ReLU network with zero biases. You can do it with biases too, but it's easiest when the biases are set to zero. So it's obtained essentially as a sum over paths in the network, in the, basically in the computational graph of your neural net, where each path is weighted by a product of the weights along the path times the indicator function that the path is actually open at your input. This is a classic formula, but the point is that this formula you can freely differentiate with respect to whatever parameters you wanted. So if I wanted to differentiate this formula with respect to some weights or some biases, I get a sum over paths formula for the NTK itself. And so what you ultimately get, for example, if you take the derivative with respect to one of the weights, is you get a sum over paths that only goes through that particular weight, essentially of the product of weights along the path, and then you divide by the weight that you actually differentiated with respect to, because it gets canceled out so, so what I'm saying in essence is that you can get nice combinatorial formulas, at least potentially nice, for any observable you want that has to do with the function value and its derivatives with respect to any parameters. And then if you're willing to go through the combinatorics, you can use the combinatorics of path counting to get moment estimates for all these random variables. And so you do that for the NTK and you get the results that I stated, you know, if you just have enough coffee and enough motivation sort of. Okay, so, so, so let me just say one other thing about it. The NTK is kind of hard to analyze in this way. It's a little bit less clean, but you can do this analysis also for the input-output Jacobian. And what you can get is that um, essentially you need to fix the input to the network. This is why it can only do one X. These indicator functions of whether different neurons in your network are on and off turn out to be statistically independent of each other and independent of the weights in the network at initialization. That's sort of a non-trivial statement, and it's not true if you have multiple inputs. So, so that's somehow a key ingredient to the calculations, and maybe let me just stop there. Yes? So uh, what do you think the, the single ex external um, bounds are the important bounds other than the octagonal? Yeah, so, so that's a fair question. So, okay, one answer is the on-diagonal bounds the off-diagonal by some Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So if you want to know that something has to be small, you could bound the it. Th that's right. So, but the real answer is that to prove a theorem of finite depth and width is not so easy to get all the right constants. And I can really do the analytics when you have a single input to the network. But empirically, you can, you can so empirically, the results work just fine for off-diagonal as well. But, but yeah, you know, I don't know how to prove the theorem. Uh, one more? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so these two different features that both at initialization and also the evolution of the, of the NTK kernel. So which one do you think is more important? <coughs> Very captures of more realistic things that happen. So if, if assume that it wouldn't change in real networks or that. So, so, so there, there's some work on double descent curve and the jamming transition, which suggests that, at least heuristically, when you do the NTK at finite depth, it's the fluctuations at init that dominate versus the fluctuations that you get throughout training as a function, at least, of the finite width correction. So, so that's some vote for only the thing at init, but I'm not completely certain on this theory. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.